So today I'm so glad to talk about one of the topics in HR that I'm very passionate about is on the human resources talent attraction. So by show of hand, let me ask you this question. How many of you have hired people before? Great, almost everybody. What about another show of hand when you say that you have made 100% perfect, no regret hiring decision every single time? <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. Um, in my 10 years of human resources management experience, I've probably interviewed more than 250 people. And I would never say that 100% time uh, that I've made perfect hiring decisions. Sometimes recruitment to me feels like a gambling game that we make our best educated guests at interview and we just wish ourselves good luck afterwards. Um, so today, even though our theory is called HR in the box theories, I would like to take you outside of box and rethink about talent attraction a little bit. This is a habit that I developed since I started teaching at post-secondary institutions, is that I usually start a session by asking questions. Um, I hope by now that you've introduced to each other but uh, I have not heard about your introduction. So I would like to really just go around the room, besides talent pool experts here, just get to know your name, uh, which company you work for, and what kind of role you play in your company. And then we'll dive into the uh, discussions for today. May we start with you? Okay, great. Well, I hope by now that you have introduced each other to each other and shook hands and uh, got the day started because the rest of the day we're going to rely on each other's brain power to go through the case studies as well as answer quite talented, intelligent questions, actually tough ones. So if I can get you to get into groups of five to six, um, you pick your partners. Just don't throw darts at each other. If you have to do so, just do so in the bathroom. Um, so I would like you to really start thinking about your own organization. How would you rate about your organization during the hiring practice? And what are the top two challenges that your company face in today's talent markets? And then also what are the top two contributing factors to these two uh, challenges? So let's say in the next seven minutes, let's go, please. All right, hello everybody again. Yeah. I heard some uh, really, really exciting discussions amongst the tables close to me. And I know, but uh, because of the limit in time, so we have to get it restarted again. Um, I really would like to hear some of your answers. So if we can just go around the room and uh, let me first ask you this question. Is I'm going to ask you to rate. So by showing me your fingers, just now the middle finger, um, <laughs> on a scale between one and 10, how would you rate your organization's hiring practice? Please give me, show me your fingers. Yeah, right now, yeah, the current practice. Zero? Well, I don't no. know, we haven't hired anyone. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was the last person they hired. Okay, I hope that wasn't a zero. <laughs> okay, great, thank you everybody. So mostly I just do, did a quick math count, so the average is about six to seven uh, for hiring practice, which is very common amongst the clients that I serve and the stories I hear as well. What about just anybody in this room, what are the top two challenges that your organization faces when it comes to recruitment? Applicants. How do you mean by qualified? Uh, well, so okay. What yeah. they need to be on the job. Okay, great. What are the other challenges that you face? We need to watch. Oh, forgot about that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, health and safety comes on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dance and health and safety. <laughs> I think um, defining the role that we're hiring for because we multitask. Right. As smaller organizations, sometimes we wear too many hats at once. Yeah, great. Any other challenges? I think the, one of the biggest challenges we have in Hinton is that um, as a small business, we have to compete with tech. We have to compete with the pulp mill. We have to compete with the hint and wood. We have to compete with all these others. And their wage is set here, stay here. So as a company, how do you how do you bring in people who will feel worth and also enjoy their job? And that's really tough. Great. We'll try to address these questions throughout the presentations today. I know what I will talk about this morning, this afternoon, and a few other experts in the room will share more information on your question today as well. Any other challenges that uh, has not been addressed? 
Okay, well, some sounds like three great challenges for us to take discussions throughout the day. That's good. What about the contributing factors? I think we talk about this a little bit. It has to do with the location, has to do with the compensation, the competition within the region, and then as well has to do with the size of the organization. Sometimes maybe just the lack of the experience because we have been small, we had been newer, and the location is a restriction as well itself. So let's go through this, um, and I'll try to address some of the questions. Is that in my, this is this re, uh, definition that I really like. So talent attraction, basically another term for recruitment, is a combined effort of the workforce planning that Chris has talked about a little bit, company branding. So how do we brand our names out there? How do we define ourselves in the marketplace? What sets us apart compared to our competitors within the region or within a bigger geographical location? And it also includes the recruitment, selection process, and do not forget about the onboarding experience, which I'll spend a lot more time talking about this afternoon as well. However, is this all for recruitment? What's really missing here, in my humble opinion, is that we forgot to take into consideration of the changing in the talent market in today's society. So we all know that the workforce around us has changed. Um, I don't see as a diverse demographics in this room as I would see for, um, in the bigger cities. However, the workforce around us has changed, and it's now quietly changed. It's really loud. Technology has really shaped what we do, how we do, and when we do our work. And if you look around the downtown Edmonton or Calgary fancy newer office, tall office buildings, it's all transparent glass windows, big windows that um, they take into consideration of the environmental structure, um, environmental materials, and they really encourage discussions. So they have less cubicles, but more open offices. So that encourages us discussions, dialogues, brainstormings, and of course, rumors. <laughs> and if you look around job postings these days, it's not uncommon to see that even with entry-level positions, employers are looking for more more experience, more certifications, more qualifications, more skill sets, more than human beings. And even if it's a frontline customer service role to a back office manager role, even to an operations management position, we're constantly seeing job postings requiring people to have multitasking skills, um, organizational, time management skills, technical expertise, plus the communication and interpersonal skills. Nobody works in silos anymore. And with the economy the way that it is, um, the organizations are really looking forward to do more with less. How can we maximize efficiency by cutting down the costs? These are the constant questions that employers are exploring ways to do it. And then, however, if we look at today's millennial workforce, what are they asking for? Work-life balance. I don't want to do more with paid less. Right, so by 2020, actually the Canadian workforce, 50% of us will be formed by the Gen Y, which another term to call it is the millennials' generations. And they have very, very different expectations, to say the least, or workplace behaviors. Um, they constantly ask us, what's in it for, for me? If I want to join your company or not, what do you give me? Instead of, this is who I am, this is what I will bring to your organization, they ask the opposite question, what's in it for me? Where can I utilize my strength, still get well paid, and keep my work-life balance? So that's a constant struggle battle between what I see as the new generation entering into the workforce and the employers wanting to hire the best candidates. The market is also changing in a way that in the past, I've seen more companies produce goods, services, products to shape the consumers in the, in the market. Whereas today, if the company wants to survive, they really have to listen to customers. What do our consumers say, customers say? What do they want? What kind of products and services? What are the new trends in the marketplace that we need to take into consideration? So all of this take into consideration. It's not moving. What's the mouth? Yeah. So in the past, the top management, the companies really shape the consumer's market, shapes the market. Today, if the management wants to stay, if the company wants to stay competitive and uh, stay in business, they need to ask the customers, what do we want to produce? What do we need to produce this time? What do we need to change? And be more innovative, be more adaptive. 
there are so many ways that we can hear from our customers through the social media, through the surveys, through conversations. When customers come into our store or location, ask some questions. A lot of times companies in Edmonton would even have these customer appreciation nights, give them free meals, pamper them really well, and hope that you can hear the real and true thoughts from the customers. So what does that mean? To sum up, it's really about taking a look at today's talent market from an agility perspective, an agile workforce. That's the concept I would like to introduce today. So agility is really the ability to adapt to change and also respond to an altered stimulus in a specific yet effective way. It's the strength, coordination, and balance of all the inner, inner elements to react efficiently to something which is new, external. And it's a mindset, it's a behavior. So if that sounds too complicated, another really good quote from the Chief Human Resources Officer at Redstat North America, he said that talent scarcity continues to weigh on the top management's mind. 33% reporting as the top reason to build an agile workforce because they could not hire the most qualified and suitable candidates for their, to serve their company's needs. Especially in today's society, the economy the way it is, projects come and go. And the future of the work will require high-skilled workers with niche specialties and workers who is increase, increasingly content to have an agile career rather than a permanent one which speaks to a lot about our younger generation in the workforce today. So I have summarized the agile workforce into four major components. What do we want people to do in our organization? Is it a traditionally defined, very restrictive roles that we want them to do? Or is it more competency-based, wider scope developed? Especially majority of us in this room are small uh, business owners or smaller nonprofit organizations with less than 100 people, right? We're less than 50 people. So that's important for us to find. Our role may not be just sitting at desk and data entry. That may not be a full-time position. What else can we ask that data and enter entry clerk or admin professional to do on top of that? Still satisfy our organization's needs to have the work done, but it also gives a career challenge and career gro growth to our admin professional at the front desk, for example. Who is going to carry out the work? Is it a traditional, permanent, full-time, unionized workers? Or is that going to be more contingent workers that we'll take into consideration? What about the time? I know that we have the core business hours we need to operate. And yes, within these core business hours, uh, we need to have people, people doing the jobs. But those hours do now need to be def uh, strictly defined outside of the core business hours. If we have a hard time attracting people, and if we're allowing flexible hours, can we attract a stay-at-home mom to work for us on a part-time or casual basis? They would require some flexibility in their hours. So how do we serve to that niche market that we have ne never tapped into in the past? It's now, I worked in the corporations as an HR professional for quite a few years before I started doing my own HR consulting. But not until I started doing my own consulting, I realized that actually my most productive hours are outside of Monday to Friday, nine to five hours. It's actually evenings. <laughs> so that's something I didn't realize until I started doing my own, uh, setting on my, my own schedule and start working for myself. And then what about where do we work? When we have a computer, when we have a phone these days, besides these um, technical positions, they have to be at a certain location. These other positions, do we really need them to be in the office nine to five, Monday through Friday? Or do we just care about the results? Where they work, how does the process look like, we can care a little bit less. Gives them more flexibility and makes the workforce a little bit more attractive to different kinds of workers. So for example, when I carry my laptop or I carry my phone, I can work on a bus on my way to, uh, to, to, to go teaching at uh, McKinley University. Sometimes when I wait for clients, I work in the car. <laughs> so I don't waste any time, but the work is produced. As long as there's Wi-Fi, as long as there's a, is a compu uh, computer access to it, I can work anywhere. So agile working is really about bringing people, process, connectivity, and technology, time and place together to produce the most effective results. And it's about getting the work done, but without boundaries. So really asking us to think outside the box to rethink about talent attraction process. If that definition sounds too complicated, because that's from the British, um, my humble definition of agile workforce 
is a workforce that takes into consideration of the changing demand of the market, as well as the demographics, the talent market, while still delivering the organizational results that support our demand in an effective and creative way. All in all, in one sentence, it's all about transforming our work. <coughs> the way we work, what we do, how we do it. In order to build an agile or more flexible workforce, we're actually looking at many, many different things. And this is not a human resources one-on-one -on -one agile workforce development, so I will just go through the steps a little bit quicker. An organization today looks like organizational design instead of the traditional top-down approach, hierarchical CEO, executive senior VP, junior VP, senior director, junior director, senior manager, junior manager, so on and so forth. Maybe can we look at more a flatter structure that people report to each other based on the work they do instead, instead of based on just on authority. And then in the um, uh, project-based organizations, many organizations looking at metrics reporting relationship or dual reporting relationship, uh, reporting relationship. So we report to each other based on the technical issues or based on the projects instead of just based on you are my manager, I need to take half an hour off during my break, uh, uh, after my break, that I need to fill out paperwork. So let's save that really strict process, save that time, the half an hour time, and just get the work done. Workplace design. Um, so as I mentioned, in the bigger cities these days, if you go around these fancy newer tall office buildings, it's all about transparency, it's all about open office space, a little bit less cubicles or lower cubicles. Facebook, of course, they have the money, and they're the most famous in the world for open office design. They have the biggest open office design office. Everybody works together and it saves the organizational cost <coughs> without building these walls, without building all of these conference rooms and stuff. Everybody sits together. Yeah, it's a little bit noisy. You hear things here and there, but it really encourages dialogues and project work to be done. In uh, the McKinney University, where I teach part-time in Edmonton, uh, we are lucky enough to be building a social innovation hub. So a lot of my clients are in the nonprofit sector, so I understand their challenge. So I encourage them to look at this social innovation hub because it's a shared office space where the nonprofit, smaller ones or the newer ones, they come to rent out space for a cheap discounted rate and they share the support services such as IT, finance, HR. And they also share the washrooms, the conference rooms, the kitchen, and also gives them opportunities to brainstorm, ask each other questions, bounce ideas off of each other. We even have larger nonprofits, United Way, for example, wanting to rent a space just for the duration of a particular project because they're going to rely on the, main, the brain power of the people who are also renting the, uh, the space at that location. Benefits and compensation. Does the traditional define benefits that, you know, if you count your, uh, your tenure, times a formula, then you know what to expect when you, when you retire. Do younger people still have that kind of loyalty to stay with a company for 35 years and plus to get a full pension? That's why the defined contribution pension plan these days are gaining popularity, is that risk transfer, transfer from the employers to the employees to make their own investment decisions, but manage their own uh, pension, uh, pension funds. And also in the way that traditionally organizations will offer fixed uh, healthcare plans, which means, you know what, employees, this is all we offer, you take it or lose it. Versus today's society, lots of employers are offering flex benefits plan, which means they have a pool of benefits programs and services offered for employees to pick and choose which ones suit their family situation the best. Recruitment will talk about it today. Employee management and communication, this is a key one because employees come to organizations when they really enjoy the culture, the leadership, the supervisors. So do we still take a traditional top-down approach that I am the boss, I'm going to say something, you better listen and you better follow it. Versus today's society, we're encouraging brainstorming, encouraging different ideas, encouraging innovations, encouraging teamwork. And then also for training and development, that uh, those of us who work in HR, we probably know the 70, 20, and 10 rule. So that as an adult learner, 70% of us gain the materials and knowledge through um, learning on the job. Through basically sitting at a, not sitting at us, but really doing the job once you start working for an organization. So learning by doing. 20% of us, 20% um, so of the learning is gained through the day-to-day -day interactions with other experts, with other coworkers. 
So these opportunities come from dialogues, teamworks, interactions at the workplace, as well as what we're doing here today. You are here to hear us, the rest of us who are presenting today. It's a dialogue, it's an interaction. So we're hearing each other's challenges, we're answering some questions, we're having a discussion, we're helping each other out. And then the rest of 10%, of course, the formal uh, classroom training, education, then we can also think about ways to avoid for people to go to a formal classroom, spend the time in the drive, spend time in the classroom while their phones keep beeping. What about offering seminars, webinars? What about pulling different smaller organizations with similar challenges together and have a few people come talk to us and, be ta and have that training program tailored to our needs? <coughs> I've talked enough. So another question for you is that in the next five minutes, I would like you to think on your own. So this is the part that was all the, the teamwork. Uh, what are the changing demands of my particular organization? And what's the impact on recruitment? So let's do five minutes. All right, so most of you have stopped writing. So let me hear some answers, please. What may be some of the changing demands of your organization and how has that impacted your recruitment practice? <laughs> um, I think that the largest challenge that we have is um, we have a large cohort of baby boomers and Generation Xers who are at the top yep. who are not um, really buying into the whole surge of the millennials and they want work-life balance and they want different hours to work and yep. and that whole concept of what can you give me rather than I've hired you and you'll do the job. Yep. So there seems to be like a reluctance to go there. And yeah, I, I think that's definitely my biggest challenge. Yeah, and for those baby boomers, so, and I hear lots of echoes of, of similar challenges. So for the baby boomers who are now used to it, I don't know how they're dealing with their kids at home, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's a similar challenge they experience at home, right? And my answer to that is, it's not a matter of if we're going to have millennials enter the workforce or not. It's only, it's a reality, it's a yeah. fact. It's only a matter of when we're going to see more of them. So let's be ready for it earlier. How can we adapt to them? How can we make the workforce still um, suitable for our <coughs> company's objectives and still engage these workers? Because we all know recruitment can be really, really costly. We don't want to hire a millennial and hoping that that person can work out only to find out that he doesn't like the organization and he's going to quit the next month. Right, so that's very costly. It's a very challenge. It's a challenge for sure. <laughs> Very good capture. Um, I think Christy raised a good point that I think there are generational differences today in the workplace, and uh, it's hard. It's it, it seems that there's sometimes conflict, so we don't really have a lot of conflict resolution skills or um, understanding personality differences, values differences, things like that, different perspectives. Yeah. So I think that's a changing demand in today's organizations. Um, from what I hear Christy saying, like some of the boomers have a hard time working alongside Gen Y, um, maybe think, I don't know, they're spoiled or lazy or something, but they just have a different work style. Yeah. I also think a problem is that a lot of boomers are getting ready to retire and there's going to be this exodus of workers that may have, uh, I think back in the past generations, people have stayed with their job for their whole life. Yeah. Whereas today the trend is to work someplace and then move on, yeah. use, use workplaces as stepping stones, yeah. or they just like to go somewhere else and try something new. Yeah. People are very curious and uh, not afraid of trying new things. Whereas past generations, you know, you might work at the mill or at a organization for 30, 40 years. So there's um, uh, some organizations lack or don't want to think about succession planning, which I think is a gap. They don't know what a succession plan is or how to go about one, but I think it's important um, to expect the exit of all these senior workers who have all that knowledge and wisdom and experience. And I'd like to see those lifelong workers transfer some of their knowledge and wisdom to the younger ones and that would take a bit of time to mentor them and coach them and so I think that's a challenge so it does impact recruitment you want to onboard the younger generations and mentor them a little bit but also give them the flexibility and freedom to do things their own way the way that they learned in college or university um, 
So yeah, there's definitely some challenges between the two the, the generations. I also think that a lot of people that we're hiring or onboarding today have that certificate or that diploma or that degree, but they don't have a lot of um, real life experience, work experience. So that's a challenge too. Yeah, absolutely. So I heard that uh, Lisa had actually mentioned almost everybody's problem in today's society as an employer. <laughs> so succession planning, Doug Elloway will address this afternoon and then talk about conflict resolution between the generations. A lot of it is really just the different styles and different personalities and ideas. It's misunderstanding, to say the least. Um, you will have the same issue between grandparents and kids at home, right? It's not that I don't love you, grandpa, it's just I don't buy you to what you have said. So how do we deal with that generational difference? One company that I worked at, and I'm very lucky that to have the opportunity to work in that organization, we had a workforce that has people from more than 20 countries, speak all kinds of languages, and age between 16 to over 70. Uh, and gender and uh, difference, of course, as well. So an educational background difference. So that's a huge demographics difference amongst the younger ones with the older ones. And the older ones at that time I worked at organization did not have much computer skills. They were used to do their job, they were good at doing their job, they just want to retire from the job, and it will unionize the environment, so it's relatively stable and safe. For the younger generations, they want to get things done quicker, get things done differently, still have fun. They want to play while they're working. They don't call themselves horse playing, they call themselves having fun at work, right? So that's their enjoyment, that's in their engagement. And so what we did, we piloted a program for one department that has the most difference in the age groups, is to have the older generation partner up with the younger generation and assign them in the group as buddies. And they work alongside with each other that we actually push them out of the comfort zone that they don't, they don't have a choice but to work with each other. Just two of them, get a job done. The boss counts on the results, don't care about the process. Right, so, and then that situation at the beginning was tough. But then throughout the process, after two to three months, we had realized that they started getting along and getting to really listen to what each other has to say about that opinion. I recently had a client called me that he is in his retirement age. And uh, he has a younger boss who is 24 year old. This is the first supervisory job the boss has ever had didn't agree a thing with this older worker has been doing, and they had a conflict. And the old, my client called me and asked me, what should I do? And I said, it's not a conflict. It's really just talk it out. It's communication difference, it's preferences difference. So have an open conversation, speak about the differences, and also speak from your experience. So the younger supervisor came into the workforce, also wants to establish, establish her authority too. You know, she's aware that I'm less experienced, I'm younger, and I still have to manage a whole group of older and experienced workers. So how do I do it? The wrong approach is to say, you better listen to me, right? Older workers won't buy into it. So again, a lot of times it's really about having that open dialogue. And at the same time, does the organization support that open dialogue? Are the executive directors, are the leaders, the CEOs of the company already lead by examples? Are they encouraging open dialogues? Are they walking around and checking on people to see how they're doing, what are the barriers, what are some roadblocks that I can help remove? Um, so company HP, we all know, they had introduced this idea called uh, managing by walking around since the 1970s. So the managers really walk around to see how people are doing and check, have regular checkings on them. It's not to stand behind back of the computer screen and see, oh, you're checking on Facebook. <laughs> that doesn't work anymore today, right? So walking, managing by walking around is really to see how people are doing, checking, have a regular conversation. We're all humans in the workplace. When I teach universities, I tell my students, we're not robot resources. We're called human resources for a reason. It's all about building that relationship and trust between people. How many people leave, really leave the workforce because of the work? They leave the workforce because of people and the culture, right? And I will address that even more in, today, in this afternoon's presentation. So I'm doing a little bit of sales one presentation in the morning. <laughs> and uh, so before we think about hiring, agile recruitment or traditional recruitment, really like, let's ask ourselves, do we need to hire? Because we all know hiring is expensive. It takes a lot of time and effort. And then, as I mentioned, sometimes it's a gambling game, right? So we need to ask ourselves, do we need to hire? If so, why? So I have summarized the reasons to hire into six different boxes, so six different reasons. When a company is growing, 
especially when we start off as a mom and pop shop or a smaller organization, we, grow, we are growing organically, we need to grow the business, we just need to hire additional bodies to do similar work that's already established. That's easy. When our companies need to adapt to the technology change or to adapt to the customer demands or that our company wants to tap into different markets, then we may need to hire people with different skill sets. That requires a little bit more digging into how do we define a job. Let's do a job analysis first, then we define the job, post, job description and job posting and screen the candidates accordingly. Retirement. So Lisa had touched a little bit about succession planning about retirement. So we, in Alberta, we had removed the mandatory retirement age since 2014. Even though there is no retirement age, we still see a lot of people retire once they have reached their pension age or once they feel that they're okay to retire. But what I've also seen in my clients' organizations is that it's a steady trend of retiring at phases instead of retiring at all at once. By that, I mean phased retirement is an approach that um, the senior workers, the older workers, they retire um, at gradually reduced hours. So they don't have to say that, you know, I was so busy at work last week, and this week I've been sitting at home and looking at the windows and, and don't know what to do anymore. And that's where issues come, uh, sickness and issues come around. So what the, retirement, uh, the older workers these days are more doing is that uh, they're saying to their boss, if we can manage this schedule, let me do a phased retirement. So I will gradually retire, reduce my hours gradually. So this, week, uh, this month, I'll work six hours per day instead of eight. Next month, maybe I'll reduce that to four and eventually move out of your organization. And the benefits of doing that, of course, is to give that mental readiness for the older workers, but at the same time, it's giving our young workers or whoever we transition the work to that opportunity to learn, the opportunity to bridge the knowledge, transfer of knowledge. And then we also see um, retired workers taking a different approach in their retirement life. They don't just sit at home taking care of grandkids or watching TV or doing groceries anymore. What they also do is have a completely different career. They, in the past, they may be the bank, uh, the vice president of a bank. Now they're selling groceries in the grocery store where they're doing volunteer work at Red Cross, for example. They just want a different lifestyle, right? People die later these days. We live healthier, we live longer. So people want to contribute back to society in a different way. Still is meaningful, still is fun. And a lot of organizations, when they have a hard time hiring from the major talent market, they tap into the retirement community. Is that we still have people who are healthy, who are sharp, experienced, just want to do a little bit less work, maybe by hours, maybe by the different methods of work. So, and that's what a lot of my clients tap into is their retirement opportunity, uh, retirement markets. Leave of absence, so the larger organizations these days, they want to really attract and retain their workers. They're being innovative, so they give leave of absence for people, of course, the math leave, the parental leave, that's the typical. But they also give people opportunities to take further education, maybe in a different field. In the, uh, um, some large consulting companies in the States, they even allow you to work for another company to take a leave of absence because their belief is that the grass is not always, not always greener on the other, in the other person's yard. And they will also allow you to take leave of absence for traveling, for volunteering, um, just to better yourself. They believe when you come back, you're fresh, you gain knowledge, you're more mature. Resignation, of course, and then termination. Um, layoffs, terminations for just cause, or just severance paid out for not fit for the organizations. So there are many reasons why we hire people, but really ask ourselves, when these people leave our organizations, do we need to backfill? If so, how do we backfill, backfill that position? Is it just the same position we're repeating again, or are we doing something completely different? Every time when we have recruitment needs, it's a perfect opportunity for us to assess our recruitment needs and how we're going to fill that position. As I mentioned many times, and that uh, recruitment can be very costly. I don't know if anybody in the organization has developed metrics to really track the cost of recruitment. The cost of recruitment has many foes. People, time, effectiveness. The most obvious cost is the advertisement cost. And I once worked in smaller uh, nonprofit organizations as well. The budget has always been an issue that my boss told me just post it on free resources, wherever you can. So I really had to go out of my way to think creatively, where are the free resources that are still being seen by the talent market that I want to tap into? 
other things are hiring managers' time, HR people's time, or your office manager's time if you don't have HR departments. And what about developing the job description, job posting? What about screening resumes? What about uh, conducting the interviews? What about if you need to relocate somebody and that relocation fee is also a cost, right? In order to build a really, really effective recruitment case, we also need to think about the politics. Why did our people leave at the first place? Did they leave because of maybe a bad manager? If that's the situation, we need to deal with our bad manager first. Otherwise, the next person hired into the company will probably experience a similar situation. Then the morale will also be impacted if we're now dealing with the bad manager. Organizational changes. Um, I've seen many changes in organizations in Edmonton, especially given the economy the way it is. So if we're having structural changes, leadership changes, let's not have the recruitment process already started, leave our candidates hanging while we're figuring out what kind of changes positions we're going to have. I've seen that quite a bit with larger organizations. They think, okay, we have a vacancy, we need to fill it. And the organization is constantly going through change. Candidates are brought into for the interview process. At the end, they don't hear a thing from the company for two to three months, sometimes even up to a year because the company haven't fig really figured out what they want to do yet. Um, and collective bargaining agreements and past practices. These are all contributing factors to think about for, in, in, for recruitment. And then for those of you who really track your costs for recruitment, because some are hard costs that's easy to track, some are really the soft costs that's hard to track. But on the average, a new person, uh, a recruitment cost of a particular position can cost you anywhere between one and time, half times to three times of your new hire's first year salary. That's how expensive recruitment can be. The traditional recruitment pr approach, the process, is first we want to identify, okay, now we have a vacancy. And we really know that's a legitimate vacancy. We have a legitimate recruitment needs. Then let's set aside a budget. <coughs> budget for hiring budget for training, budget for onboarding. Because when you hire someone, that person is not going to start on the first day and say, I'm going to produce 100%, I'm going to just deliver exactly how you want it, even exceed your expectation. I haven't seen that happen at all yet. It will take some time. So that initial training onboarding pr uh, process, that loss of productivity, that getting to know the workforce, that integration process, that's all costs. Analyze the job, and then we create the job description, job posting, we post the job, we collect screen shortlist, we do the interviews, we do the background checks. As Chris has already mentioned, it's very critical. And then we offer, and this is my pet peeve, definitely, definitely let your unsuccessful candidates know the results. It's very easy to, uh, it's very hard to build an organization reputation as a preferred employer, but it's very easy to destroy their reputation. We all talk, and Hinton is a smaller, Anderson is a smaller community. The talent market is, is smaller as well that people talk, and if your organization has a reputation of not informing the candidates of what's going on, that reputation does carry through and does transfer quite quickly. And in my opinion is that if we, our candidates have spent the time and effort to apply, going, especially going through interview process, it's tough. How many of us really like to be interviewed on a daily basis, right? Nobody really likes that. So if they really spend the time and energy and effort to do that, let's give them the courtesy just to tell them that, thank you, maybe next time. Yeah. I really like this comment about it with hiring, having some manners. I can give you two examples recently. I know a gentleman who had three interviews. Uh, they were uh, two on Skype and one by phone. They said we'd get back to him on Wednesday. He's still waiting to hear back a few months later whether he got the job or not. And I just thought that that's where's your manners when you've interviewed a person three times. I know another gentleman went up an hour and a half from Edmonton to uh, a community about an hour and a half north to have an interview. And uh, he's still waiting. To, that was back in the spring. He's still waiting to hear if he got the job or not. And I'm going, are you kidding me? This isn't just people sending in applications, understandably. But these are people actually going to the interviews, going three times and doing that and they don't have the courtesy to get back to them, I think it's just, uh, well, simple, bad manners. But, so I thought I would just yeah, reinforce you, what you said there. Yeah, great. And there will be our uh, next speaker. So there is a great introduction to his topic too. And then um, after that, we have uh, offered our successful candidates. The next step will be the orientation on onboarding, which I'll talk about in this afternoon's presentation. When we assess a candidate from the traditional lens, 
we're asking ourselves three simple questions. First of all, can a candidate do the job? Do they have the technical qualifications, the hardcore requirements we ask the person to have, plus the uh, behavioral uh, qualifications, the soft skills, the attendance, the safety, um, and the leadership if we're asking them to, do, to take on the managerial position? And then, will the person do the job? Will the person have the attitude and fit in to do the job for our organization? And will the candidate fit in really within our culture, within our environment? And usually, it's the longer history your organization has, the more time and more complex it's going for the new hire to be oriented and integrated into the organization. However, today's topic is on agile recruitment. Those were just traditional, very uh, common practices when it comes to recruitment. What I would like you to challenge you to think about is the um, different way of thinking about recruitment. I think about the core competencies of my organization first and narrow that down into the competencies I require the candidates to have to do the job. What is a core competency? It's basically what keeps me in business as an organization. What sets us apart? It's not the physical assets. It's actually what keeps us running in business. What's the specialty? What's the niche of our business? What keeps us different from others? In other words, what's our competitive advantage? And these, the core competencies are really the things that we rely on the technical experts and the soft skill experts to do the job, to deliver a good job in order for our business to be prosperous and to sustain business to be competitive. However, many of us spend lots of time on the non-core competency work, which is the day-to-day, -day routine, repetitive, non-challenging tasks. A lot of us do spend time on things that should that really should contribute to the core competency of the organization, but spend the time on the opposite. Think about, if you, start, if you go back to your workforce tomorrow, really draw down notes, and this is a habit that I have, is to keep track of how much time I spend on each of my duties. What of these duties are core competency work that really contribute to the growth of the company? That if I don't do these jobs, the company is not going to survive. And how much time do I spend on the routine tasks that do not contribute as much to the growth of the organization. To really think, ask yourself these questions. What aspects of my job contribute to the core competencies and what does not? And do I spend an even percentage of time on things that should contribute more to the company's growth, but on the day-to-day -day stuff? Rethink about the recruitment selection process is first we ask ourselves, okay, what are the core competencies of our organization? How do we survive in business? What's, what sets us apart? And then what kind of workers can really fill these needs? What are the options? So let me give you some examples. And uh, so the type of workers traditionally we have are the employee, full-time, experienced, fixed-time employees. In today's society, as I mentioned, demograph demographics shift, shift. The younger generations may not like the traditional hierarchical positions anymore and have a boss walk around uh, watching my, over my shoulder, see what I'm doing. So today's society, also we have lots of people entering, uh, coming back to the workforce after they've give, given birth to a few kids, where they have retrained themselves going through education, especially with the economy the way it is. Um, lots of people get laid off, so they went back to training. Now they're ready to be back to the workforce again. So can we be a little bit more open-minded to think about different kinds of workers? Can we have contractors to do some temporary job? where it's a technical expertise job that we just cannot hire from the local market, where we don't have internal resources to do, but we can rely on the contract to do for a time, short, short period of time. So once that contractor has done the job for us, built a system, built a process, we can rely on that system process going forward. We just need to kick a start in that, in that process. Full-timers versus part-timers. Part-timers, if you have two part-timers that can still make up a traditional full-time position, but you are giving more flexibility, you are giving more tolerance to different workers' needs, and that sets a reputation for yourself. And then also experienced versus non-experienced. Think about the core work versus the non-competency, non-core competency work. With the non-core competency work, if we really have to have people to do it, can we get someone who is a little bit less experienced so we pay less? and we have a bigger cho uh, more choices to tap, tap into the talent pool to get the work done. As long as that somebody is doing the quality control at the end of the day, I think that still will be okay. 
Employees versus volunteers. A lot of us in this room are from the nonprofit sectors, and we've managed volunteers to some extent just as managed employees. <laughs> and a lot of us do rely on the volunteer communities. As I mentioned, the lots of uh, retired senior workers, they don't want to just sit at home and doing nothing. They do still want to contribute back to society, and they can contribute back in, in a way as a part-timer or as a volunteer. Fixed time versus flex time. So really think about the core business hours we need to open, but outside of that, if we want to have the work done, we can have some flexible around our scheduling. With the example of talent pool, for example, we only have one full-time position, right? So other people are just contractors. So we still get the job done, and, but we're looking at the market, we're looking at organizational structure slightly different. And then the hiring direction, so where can we tap into these talents? So traditionally, we just acquire, basically means just hiring. But now, I think Chris has also mentioned this a little bit, can we look at internally first and do the succession planning, do the knowledge transfer? Do we have internal talents that can be developed into a more senior position? So we develop them, and then of course their position have to be backfilled or restructured. That's a different story. Local talent versus global. I'm not asking you to think about myself outside of continents, but just think a little bit outside of the Hinton, Edison, Jasper area. Um, if the workers can work over internet, work over technology, then it doesn't really matter where they're from, where, where the work gets done. And then attract and relocate. Relocation can be really expensive. So this is the trick of one organization, cheap organization I worked at, is that when we had to relocate workers, we just know we couldn't hire the local, local talents. We asked them that, you know what, our company does not pay for relocation. Would you still be interested? And the people who really buy into your organization's values and they want to come to your location, they will say yes. They may negotiate a few other things, but you know that they want to join your organization. There are things, the core competency of your organization attract them. So let's go back to, let's move again. Yeah. Agility of technology doesn't always exist. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, yeah. Let me ask you this question then, since we're dealing with technology issues. How, how far would you reach out to the talent market outside of our local region? How far have you reached out? Let me ask you this question. Like to Calgary? Grand Prairie, okay, yeah. Is it the culture? Uh, I'm not sure, I wasn't with Okay. Okay. Should be good. If not, just give me the. No, I don't know. Okay. All right. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, and then we ask ourselves, okay, we have these kind of workers fulfill the needs of our core competency work, and we talk about some options. What about the non-core work? What should we do with them? Are they taking our boss majority of the boss time? For non-core competency work, then it's not value added. It's actually wasting time and money of our organization to have our boss doing that kind of work. Our boss time should really be spending on growing the organization, leading the change, and managing the organization in the proper way to stay competitive in the marketplace. And then what can we change internally to make our organization more attractive? If younger worker is your choice, um, sometimes you may not have the choice, but what, can, what else can we do? Flex hours, a different culture, a different way of looking at talents, maybe a different way to attract talents. And how can we spend less, if possible? And where do we find these workers? This is a organizational chart, not the most intuitive one that I really, really like. I have to say I Googled it. But the structure is that this company has a home office, does not even have a hard asset, which is not intuitive because traditional, most of our organizations still have a physical location that we grouped people together and stuff. They have employees on flex time, which means flexible hours. It's not the traditional nine to five anymore. Employees in satellite office, same country, different country, um, independent contractors, telecommuters, and vendors. So the non-traditional uh, components of the workforce still has the job done. So in my consulting business, I have three uh, contra independent contractors. I don't have full-timers. I couldn't afford a full-time hours or the benefits or the pay, but I still need some expertise to get the work done. 
So I hired independent contractors that they're happy they get some work from me and they also can do their jobs or have their families or whatever the case may be. All right, so again, I've talked enough. <laughs> and so now it's your perfect opportunity to again introduce yourself to your neighbors and to look at the case study. So I would like you to open the, if there's a pamphlet or if it's just a handout. And it should look like this, it says casework. Rethink about talent attraction. So the casework is for a nonprofit organization that I uh, once um, had clients from. So the background is a local nonprofit organization, has 35 employees, 30 long-term volunteers, and 70 casual volunteers. The organization wants to hire a permanent HR manager. The position will report to the ED and it will be responsible for the day-to-day -day HR journalist functions, plus the volunteer management duties, plus the two admin staff report to this HR manager. The ideal candidate will have five to seven years of HR management experience in the nonprofit world. Relevant diploma, degree, and experience working with the underrepresented members are preferred. Um, the position has since been posted on Monster, Alumni Career website, and uh, the company's website, et cetera. The organization offers 60K as a base salary, 500 in a healthcare spending account, no other benefits, free parking, 20% discount at a close by childcare facility, a friendly environment. This is interesting, although not stress free. I wonder if there's any work environment that's stress free these days. <laughs> the challenges, of course, with, non, uh, with nonprofit is the hiring and salary budget, and low brand recognition in the market, relatively small organization. And the HR manager position has been vacant for four months. Because of that, the board of directors has, uh, has been thinking that if the organization can run without an HR manager for that long, do we really need to have that position filled? And uh, <clears throat> your table's task is uh, working with the same group of people that you just talked to, unless you really hate each other, then you can change. <laughs> Your task is to come up with what functions of this HR manager's duties are core competency work, and what functions will be considered non-core competency work. And then, if you are the organizational um, leaders, how can your organization change the approach to hiring to make this more agile? So let's do 15 minutes. All right, back to me. I hope I already had a great discussion with no fighting yet. Yeah. We will have a break, so if you need, do need to fight, that's, that's there <laughs> after the session. So back to me here, and uh, I would like to write down your answers. So can someone first or any group tell me what are the core competency work for this HR manager <coughs> caliber? What would you consider as the core competency work for this HR manager's position? Branding and promoting organization. Okay. Branding and promoting. Okay, great. Anybody else? The volunteer management. Okay. What else? So employee relations issues? <laughs> okay, what else? Recruitment? The job analysis, okay, perfect. Anything else? Would you consider these as super important functions for if you are going to pay 60 grand plus $500 for a healthcare spending account, plus the integration, the recruitment, the training, all of that time to have the HR manager managing these functions? And people who say yes, please raise your hands. And I guess the rest of you say no. So two thirds of you say yes. That's okay, someone say half, not sure. That's understandable too. Let's talk about the non-core competency work. What would you consider non-core work for this HR manager position? So 
So when you say community relations, do you mean that's tied to the branding and promotion of the organization? Or is it tied to with the volunteer management piece to it? Uh huh. <laughs> okay, and the results of that would be to attract workers or to advertise your company or just. Uh, uh, I think uh, okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Sure. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Perfect. And that's thinking outside the box, actually, away from the case study that I provided. Um, perfect. Thank you. All right. So, non core work, what would you consider as the non core work for this HR manager? <laughs> Administrative role, paperwork, phone calls. The paperwork. Hence, traditionally, people call us in HR the uh, personnel department because we administer the personnel files and paperwork, yes. What else would you consider non core? I didn't know my job as an HR person is that important. <laughs> That's good to know. What about, I think we missed a piece of the two admin person reporting to the HR manager. Would you consider that as core or non-core? Non-core? Do people agree? No, I heard. I don't agree with that. And why is that? Yeah. Yeah. Is it not their responsibility not to get fined? Yes. So it's the so compliant legislation that compliance. Like, like yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay, but why would you say that the managing the two people are non core? Oh, I would say it's core. It's core, okay. So people who think that managing the two staff are core, please raise your hands. Right, but this employee, yeah, the employee relations is for all the staff in the organization. It may not be just for the two particular men. And what did you say? I think it's employee. De okay, so the management of the two staff is kind of undecided between the two, right? So it depends on the company culture how large a company is, how complex the organization is. And then, so that's pretty much it for the duties. I didn't realize how important that HR manager's job is until you have given me out all the details. So thank you, that's really good. And the only thing you identify as non-core is the paperwork. There is no right and wrong answer with this question. That's the trick part. As in HR, we sounds like lawyers, it depends. And uh, the reason I say that, it really depends on the company culture, the strategy, how complex, and what you hope the HR manager position eventually evolve into to help my core company to grow based on our core competencies. I think what's missing here, in my opinion, is that one thing that's missing here is about that uh, strategy piece. To me, that's core competency work. In order to help the organization to move forward, we need people. An HR strategy setting and leading through that change, I think that's core. But anyway, I have written down some notes in case I forget. Um, and also, some organizations will say that um, the policy setting, the policies, writing the policies, creating the policies, and also maintaining and monitoring the policy would also be a important duty for this HR manager position. But again, for me, that's debatable between the core and non-core. It depend, really depends on what you want your managers to do in this company. Do they not manage any employee relations issues? Or do they not take care of any policies maintenance at all? It really speaks to the culture of the organization. Yes, please. Uh, that's where I kind of landed the volunteer 
Great. And what about the second question? How can we be more agile? Apparently, we have a hard time hiring for this position. I don't know if it's because we haven't posted at the right place, or is it money, or is it our organization is not attractive, or we just, you know, we're not well known for whatever reason. So, how can we be more agile in this recruitment? By possibly utilizing the employees we have, by uh -huh. allocating them. Exactly. Positions, yeah. And then they would be the support for you. Yeah, so you're basically training the trainers. So you're getting more people involved, getting the HR functions done. Yes, so that's one solution. What are some other solutions to be more sharing. agile? Pardon me? Job sharing. Job sharing, how so? Um, have employees. Yeah, maybe ask your two admin that were supposed to report to the HR manager position, are you interested? Maybe they have the interest, maybe they have the skills, they have the desire then we can groom them into taking this HR manager's position eventually, then you save the $60,000 and developing two longer term, more engaged employees. Yes. What are some other solutions? Exactly. But $60,000 contractors, they usually charge a little bit more threshold in order to get the work started because that's what they rely on. The work for them is now stable. So they do charge a premium in order to consult on work. So do you contract them on a longer term basis? as a permanent full-time staff? Or do you just contract them on a short-term basis to get some set as initial establishment done? Right, so that's another thought. Is let's say if we have identified the core competency, so legislation compliance, that requires policy setting, requires training, requires development, requires ongoing maintenance. But let alone the ongoing maintenance piece, if we're just setting up policies, training people, that could maybe be done on a contract on a short-term basis. Once we have set it up, train the trainers, maybe we don't need that person to manage that on a long-term basis. Branding and promotion, I think everybody in the company, and this is my opinion, everybody in the company has a duty, has a role to play in that. It's not just HR's job, not just because I work in HR, try to wash my hands off, but it's because if you want the company to grow, to have a good reputation in the community, everybody has a role to play in it. Volunteers do. Your CEOs do, your EDs do, your, your frontline staff do. Strategy work, it's the same thing. This is a combination between the HR manager, potential HR manager, with the leader of the organization. After we have set the strategies, you come back to review it on a regular basis to make sure that we're still in line, with, uh, aligning with our organization's values and, and, and the growth strategies. But you do not need a person to long-term maintain the strategy piece. Right, you just come back to review and adjust it, and review and adjust it. The volunteer management, in my opinion, as we had talked about, I think everybody has a role to play. If you have a volunteer, long-term 30 volunteers, been around for a long time, they know how your organization runs, they know your personnel really well, maybe you can pick one or two as the lead volunteers, and they take on more volunteer roles as the leader. Give them more opportunities, maybe you can pay them a token fee or a bonus, whatever you want to call it, give them more perks, maybe they will be happy just doing that. The community piece, and again, I think everybody has a huge role to play into it. The programming, yes, you want someone to own it, to manage it, um, not just because you can blame on that person, but you want someone to own it, to build it, but I think the same as the company branding, everybody has a role to play in that. The employee relations, and the same thing. Once we have set up the procedures to start off with, maybe the managers should be trained as well. I think the worst case scenario is that your managers are only managing the technical issues. Everything else, people related, are coming back to HR. You don't want your managers to have developed a habit saying, now my problem, you HR manage it. Then what kind of company are we creating here? What kind of culture are we creating here, right? Recruitment, 35 people organization. How much recruitment do we need to get done? Maybe based on seasons, if we have events in the summer? I'm not sure. Uh, if it's volunteer recruitment, then we tap into the current volunteers and have them spread the words out. I think initially we may need to build some programs, some processes, and maybe even some forms. Job description templates, job posting templates, uh, setting some uh, relationship with the agencies, for example. But ongoing maintenance, I don't know if we need a full-time person to manage that. And job analysis is part of that too. The paperwork, 
can we get the two admin people to be a little bit more busier? Or have other people in the company to cover more uh, tasks? So eventually, I guess we could save some money for the ED of the organization and have the HR manager's duty be a little bit more agile in that perspective. But it really depends on the organization. Some organizations rather prefer to have these all done in-house, have a person permanent full-time so the CEOs or the EDs can bounce ideas off on a daily basis. And again, it really depends on your budget, your culture, what you try to establish. So we talk about assessing a candidates. We look at, can the person do the job? Will the person do the job? And will that person fit in? When we are talking about an agile recruitment, we're still asking the same three questions, just slightly different flavor. Can the candidate do the job? Now we have identified the core work versus the non-core work. Let's take a look at the core work versus the non-core work one more time. Are we hiring people just to do the non-core work? Or are we focusing their time more on the core work? And will the candidate be able to do now we have re-identified the position? And will the candidate really fit into an agile environment? Us, as the organization's ambassadors, are we doing a good job attracting this agile workforce? Because we know people come to your organization not just because of pay, not just because of the job itself. It really has a lot to do with the people, the culture. So when we are hiring, we want to demonstrate that these um, agile traits in our hiring practices. Are we being flexible? Are we being open-minded? Are we speaking the agile workforce language? Are we giving them the look like that they had took a year off to travel after graduation? Are we looking at them like aliens? Right? Or are we really taking that into consideration that's how they mature themselves, maybe? And be passionate about our organizations. Um, I have said down in interviews that interviewers are just look like they can go to hospitals. Um, I didn't enjoy it because that speaks like they are the first people I meet. If they don't represent organizations very well, how can I go to enjoy my job? I know they don't represent the entire organization, but these are the first people I'm going to meet. Not very good first impression. And then also as a hiring manager, we want to envision the agile future, that we rely on these newer, different workers to do a slightly different kind of work. And then we do let the candidates know about the results. And again, my pet peeve. And then also, are we ready to be that agile hiring manager? Our organization's culture going to be set ready for that. So I hope that um, the presentation this morning leave you with some ideas, some thoughts. Building the agile workforce does take a long-term planning and thought process. We're not going to be able to go there tomorrow. So rest assured that, that when you go home tonight at 5 p.m., you don't have to worry about that, have everything developed by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. That's not going to be the goal. It does take careful planning, lots of thinking, thought process, but I only hope that I'm leaving you some good ideas, some good questions to think about. Thank you.